Hello and uh, welcome to Wiltshire Music Centre. Um, I'm Gavin. Uh, I'm here today with Nicola Woodward and Julie Payne. Uh, and this is Celebrating Age uh, here in Bradford and Avon. And we are thrilled to be able to still do this show because um, initially it was meant to be in the Trowbridge Library. I know we had at least 35 people coming and then the numbers started to drop out for various reasons. And we thought, I know, uh, let's see whether we can still do this show for you guys um, online. So wherever you're watching this now, I uh, hope, uh, hope you're very relaxed and comfortable and looking forward to uh, an hour or so of, um, of live music and stories and poetry. Um, I'm not bringing the music, I'm bringing these stories and the poetry, but we do have um, Nicola Woodward who plays uh, the flute and the piano and uh, a variety of other instruments, as does Julie Payne, who is uh, an oboist and pianist and uh, both general geniuses, really. So we're very lucky to, to have them and very lucky to be here. And they, they are thrilled, I think, personally, because as soon as we walked in the room... Uh, they saw the size of this uh, Steinway and uh, and both cooed and gushed and were very excited. So um, if nothing else, the sound quality is going to be incredible, I think. And, and some of the pieces they've chosen are truly uh, stunning. And they'll take you on uh, a musical journey all across the globe. And um, so, yeah, without further ado, let's get the show on the road. And um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, this is Celebrating Age. Good morning. So Julie and I would like to start off by playing the Morceau de Concours by Gabrielle Faure. I'm going to play on the piccolo. I've got a brand new head joint for the piccolo, that's this bit. I won't tell you how much it set me back, um, but I rather like it. It's beautiful. Now, tambourin is French for drum, and you'll hear very much a sort of drum beat piano accompaniment from Julie.
Okay, so this is a piece by a relatively unknown composer, Charles Kirschlin. He actually wrote 96 pieces for unaccompanied flute, and I think they're all rather wonderful. And I've just been recording them in Clifton Cathedral. So one of my favourites is Jeu de Naiades, and Naiades is a water nymph, so you'll hear the sort of watery music, and it's quite playful as well. So this is by Charles Kirschlin, um, written in 1948. Um, Julie and I have known each other for a very long time because we were actually, strangely enough, born in opposite houses um, opposite the street um, in the Chi Valley, Stanton Drew, near Chi Magna. And um, when Julie wanted to have some piano lessons, uh, Julie was about seven, I think so, seven. Yeah. and I was about 14 or 15, so that was my... My first uh, official bit of teaching, I used to pedal down the road on my bike on a Sunday morning, where Julie, full of energy, would greet me. Um, <laughs> woo! Yeah, and I was barely awake being a teenager, but you know, we go back a long way. So Julie's going to play the oboe now. We stay firmly in France with a piece by Sanson. Um, I've played this piece many times for children, um, most recently on a, on a tour of a musical zoo. And I like to think of this piece as being rather like meerkats. Um, it's very bizarre, but it starts with some very sleepy meerkats. They're all asleep, they're having a lovely time, curled up, and then they jump around and they spend the middle section of the piece jumping around, and then they go back to sleep at the end. So this is um, staying in France, but with some French meerkats. This is the middle movement of the Sanson Oboe Concerto.
hand over to Gavin now. So, hello. Um, the first piece I'm going to read you um, is a poem by the English poet and playwright Robert Browning, and it's a pretty famous one, and it ties in ever so tenuously to um, to what Nikki and Julie have just been doing, um, because it was written, actually, even though it's a very famous poem about England, uh, it was written when Robert Browning was in Italy uh, back in 1845. And um, you'll know Robert, Robert Browning, uh, if you haven't read his poems, you'll, you may have read his letters. He was uh, very famously wrote a lot of wonderful love letters between him and Elizabeth Barrett. Um, the love letters between me and my wife are, are nothing by comparison, frankly. Um, Incidentally, these two have known each other for a long time, but I, I've known Julie now, I've realised this, for, for nearly 10 years. Our, um, our, this is how we met. Our, our kids were doing the same water babies class when they were just little babies. And so if you go into those people's houses where there are, um, you know, the pictures of the baby underwater sort of looking, looking like they're flying or something, that's, uh, that's how we met. Although um, I couldn't afford that picture and decided not to go for it. But, uh, but yeah, so we've known each other a while now. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an absolute joy to, to be, be on stage with them again. Um, so this poem, uh, as I say, a very famous one, and you'll recognise the first line. The opening line is probably more famous in some ways than the poem. It says, Oh, to be in England. Um, I have the opposite thing. I long to be in other countries most of the time. But, uh, but yes, so this is called Home Thoughts from Abroad. And it goes like this. Oh, to be in England now that April's there. And whoever wakes in England sees some morning unaware that the lowest boughs and the brushwood sheaf round the elm tree bowl are in tiny leaf while the chaffinch sings on the orchard bough in England now. And after April, when May follows and the white throat builds and all the swallows hark where my blossomed pear tree in the hedge leans to the field and scatters on the clover blossoms and dewdrops at the bent spray's edge. That's the wise thrush. He sings each song twice over, lest you should think he could never recapture the first fine careless rapture. And though the fields look rough with hoary dew, all will be gay when noontide wakes anew. The buttercups, the little children's dower, far brighter than this gaudy melon flower. Thanks, Gavin. We now move on to our, on our little world tour. We go to Italy with some beautiful Chopin, I believe. Well, Chopin, and you're thinking, but hang on, Chopin's Polish. Um, Chopin was Polish, but he wrote, and um, one of the only um, romantic composers to write a good piece of music for the flute, and he based it on um, Rossini's ver um, theme from Cinderella. Now, Rossini, of course, was an Italian composer, and he wrote this tune as part of the opera Cinderella. It's the sort of happy ever after moment, and um, I'm sure you'll recognise the tune. And then Chopin took, the, that, took that theme and wrote some variations on it. So we're sort of half in Italy and half in Poland. Thank 
Thank you. So that was the Rossini um, Chopin. Chopin Rossini variations, I mean. So over to Gavin for a bit more poetry. Yes, this one is by um, the English Romantic poet John Keats, uh, who... Uh, sadly died only 25 years old uh, of tuberculosis but before he did he wrote some of my favorite poems and um, this is one of them and I think it fits quite well after the Chopin there which sort of has a sort of twittery uh, bird-like quality to it anyway um, and this is a poem called Goldfinches um, and it goes like this Goldfinches sometimes goldfinches one by one will drop from low hung branches Little space they stop, but sip and twitter, and their feathers sleek. Then off at once, as in a wanton freak. Or perhaps to show their black and golden wings, pausing upon their yellow flutterings. Thanks, Gavin. And... What better piece to follow that than with the Vivaldi concerto, Italian composer Vivaldi, a concerto called Goldfinch.
Julie and uh, Nikki will be moving on to Germany. I'm just going to very briefly detour to uh, to America. Weirdly, uh, yeah, just uh, just to just to really put the air miles in. And um, this is a piece by um, the American poet Robert Frost. And uh, I love this piece. I don't know if any of you have ever taken a de- well made a decision that you sort of immediately regretted, um, or you've or any, every decision that you've made, you've thought, Do you know what, I could have. I could have got on the bus today, but instead I caught a taxi and because of that my life is completely different or I could have I could have missed that party, I never would have met the love of my life or I could have not gone to water babies classes 10 years ago and I wouldn't have met Julie, example. Um, so uh, so this, that's what this is about. Robert Frost wrote this about his friend um, Edward Thomas who was another very famous poet um, and he wrote this in 1915 and it was sort of a joke. He wrote it as a joke for his friend, when they went out walking together, Edward Thomas was chronically indecisive about making decisions. Um, and in retrospect, always lamented that uh, they should in fact have taken the other path. And so he wrote this as a, as a joke and I don't think uh, when it came out, anybody else thought it was particularly funny, um, which I think made Robert Frost slightly doubt his own uh, poetry skills. But uh, it definitely is a wonderful poem and will make you think that, uh, that path that you didn't take. It's called The Road Not Taken. Two roads diverged in a yellow wood, and, sorry I could not travel both and be one traveller, long I stood and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear, though, as for that, the passing there had worn them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less travelled by. And that has made all the difference. We could leave this in. Um, You know, normally at a normal show, uh, if this was in the Trowbridge Library, uh, we probably wouldn't be chatting at this stage and drinking tea and eating bananas. But, you know, that's the the real world and life goes on. This this may be a good opportunity for you guys to have a banana as well at home and just enjoy yourselves. Maybe some fudge. Anything else? (laughs) Cup of tea, yeah. Little tea break. Equally, Dan, this is a good chance for you to cut, and we'll start again in a few minutes.
on to Germany and with a very famous piece by Bach. It's called Air on the G-String and it's from his D major suite. Now some Mozart. Um, this is uh, our first piece today, first piece, maybe second piece, without the piano. Um, so this is from The Marriage of Figaro by Mozart and it's a really good fun arrangement for two. But just to say that I did originally start wanting to play the flute when Nikki was teaching me piano. All I wanted to do, apart from play the piano, was play the flute and be it's just like right her. <laughs> and it's Nikki's fault that I'm playing the oboe. Now, so, I think to be fair, there are so many flute players in this world. The flute is a very popular instrument and there's not much work to go around. And I knew Julie was going to be very good. It was very obvious from the first couple of lessons. So I said, go away, try something else. And if you really don't like it, come back and I'll teach you the flute. And I'm so glad I said that. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Thank you. 
wonderful. I hope you are all, wherever you happen to be watching this, uh, applauding wildly in your in your seats. Um, this uh, this next piece is probably the most famous piece that I'm going to read. It's uh, it's a Shakespeare sonnet, and um, it's his, it's it's beautiful. It's called uh, well, famously known as "Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day," but it is Sonnet 18 for the aficionados, and it goes like this. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines by chance, or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderst in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. We stay firmly in Germany with some more Bach. This is his chorale from Cantata 147, more commonly known as Jesu Joy of Man's Desiring. As an oboist, I get asked to play this an awful lot, weddings, funerals, um, or all sorts of bits and pieces, you name it. Um, this is one of the pieces that people always ask for. I do like playing it, um, but there has, has some very, very long phrases in it. So if I go a slightly purple colour, don't worry, I am still alive. It's just the end of a very, very long phrase.
Okay, so that was Germany. We're gonna pop over to Spain now and play one of my favorite, favorite tunes. Um, this is a traditional song, so we don't know who wrote it, but it's called Spanish Love Song, and James Galway played it with Marissa Robles on the harp. Oh. So here we have Julie on the harp. <laughs> on the Steinway. Mm -hmm. It is the Segadia from Carmen. Um, Nikki and I have again done this, this similar programme with um, children uh, as a journey around the world. Um, and they quite like this one, they do like dancing to it. So if you're in the mood to get up and have a bit of a boogie, please do um, get your flamenco dresses on and fling it around the place. Yes, absolutely. Cast some nuts, flamenco Just do some hand action. Yes, <laughs> wiggle your fingers. Thank you. 
a longer story. That's right. So yes, this is a story um, by a Canadian author called Morley Callahan. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to try it much, uh, though Julie and Nikki would like me to, the Canadian accent, uh, although I will be occasionally dropping in the... Uh, sort of a, a bad American accent, just to set it in a little, little place. Um, and it's called All the Years of Her Life. They were closing the drugstore, and Alfred Higgins, who had just taken off his white jacket, was putting on his coat and getting ready to go home. The little grey-haired man, Sam Carr, who owned the drugstore, was bending down behind the cash register. And when Alfred Higgins passed him, he looked up and said softly, Just a moment, Alfred. One moment before you go. The soft, confident, quiet way in which Sam Carr spoke made Alfred start to button his coat nervously. He felt sure his face was white. Sam Carr usually said, Good night, brusquely, without looking up. In the six months he'd been working in the drugstore, Alfred had never heard his employer speak softly like that. His heart began to beat so loud it was hard for him to catch his breath. What is it, Mr. Carr? he asked. Maybe you'd be good enough to take a few things out of your pocket and leave them here before you go, Sam Carr said. What things? What are you talking about? You've got a compact and a lipstick and at least two tubes of toothpaste in your pockets, Alfred. What do you mean? Do you think I'm crazy? Alfred blustered. His face got red and he knew he looked fierce with indignation. But Sam Carr, standing by the door with his blue eyes shining brightly behind his glasses and his lips moving underneath his grey moustache, only nodded his head a few times. And then Alfred grew very frightened and he didn't know what to say. Slowly he raised his hand and dipped it into his pocket. And with his eyes never meeting Sam Carr's eyes, he took out a blue compact and two tubes of toothpaste and a lipstick and he laid them one by one on the counter. Petty thieving, eh, Alfred? Sam Carr said. And maybe you'd be good enough to tell me how long this has been going on. This is the first time I ever took anything. So now you think you'll tell me a lie, eh? What kind of a sap do I look like, huh? I don't know what goes on in my own store, eh? I'll tell you, you've been doing this pretty steady. Sam Carr said as he went over and stood behind the cash register. Ever since Alfred had left school, he'd been getting into trouble wherever he worked. He lived at home with his mother and his father, who was a printer. His two older brothers were married, and his sister had got married last year. And it would have been all right for his parents now if Alfred had only been able to keep a job. While Sam Carr smiled and stroked the side of his face very delicately with the tips of his fingers, Alfred began to feel that familiar terror growing in him that had been in him every time he had got into such trouble. "'I liked you.' Sam Carr was saying. I liked you and would have trusted you, and now look what I gotta do. While Alfred watched with his alert, frightened blue eyes, Sam Carr drummed with his fingers on the counter. I don't like to call a cop in, point blank, he was saying as he looked very worried. You're a fool, and maybe I should call your father and tell him you're a fool. Maybe I should let him know I'm gonna have you locked up. My father's not at home. He's a printer. He works nights. Alfred said. Who's at home? My mother, I guess. Then we'll see what she says. Sam Carr went to the phone and dialed the number. Alfred was not so much ashamed, but there was that deep fright growing in him, and he blurted out, arrogantly like a strong, full-grown man, Just a minute. You don't need to draw anybody else in. You don't need to tell her. He wanted to sound like a swaggering big guy who could look after himself, and yet the old, childish hope was in him the longing that someone at home would come and help him. Yeah, that's right, he's in trouble, Mr. Carr was saying. Yeah, your boy works for me. You'd better come down in a hurry. And when he was finished, Mr. Carr went over to the door and looked out at the street and watched the people passing in the late summer night. I'll keep my eye out for a cop, was all he said. Alfred knew how his mother would come rushing in. She would rush in with her eyes blazing, or maybe she'd be crying and she'd push him away when he tried to talk to her and make him feel her dreadful contempt. Yet he longed that she might come before Mr. Carr saw the cop on the beat passing the door. While they waited, and it seemed a long time, they did not speak. And when at last they heard someone tapping on the closed door, Mr. Carr, turning the latch, said crisply, Come in, Mrs. Higgins. 
He looked hard-faced and stern. Mrs Higgins must have been going to bed when he telephoned, for her hair was tucked in loosely under her hat, and her hand at her throat held her light coat tight across her chest so her dress would not show. She came in, large and plump, with a little smile on her friendly face. Most of the store lights had been turned out, and at first she didn't see Alfred, who was standing in the shadow at the end of the counter. Yet as soon as she saw him, she did not look as Alfred thought she would look. She smiled. Her blue eyes never wavered, and with a calmness and a dignity that made them forget that her clothes seemed to have been thrown on her, she put out her hand to Mr Carr and said politely, "'I'm Mrs Higgins. I'm Alfred's mother.' Mr Carr was a bit embarrassed by her lack of terror and her simplicity, and he hardly knew what to say to her. So she asked, "'Is Alfred in trouble?' "'He is. He's been taking things from the store. I caught him red-handed. Little things like compacts and toothpaste and lipsticks.' "'Stuff he can sell easily,' the proprietor said. "'As she listened, Mrs Higgins looked at Alfred sometimes "'and nodded her head sadly, "'and when Sam Carr had finished, she said gravely, "'Is it so, Alfred?' "'Yes. Why have you been doing it?' "'I've been spending money, I guess. "'On what?' "'Going around with the guys, I guess,' Alfred said. Mrs. Higgins put out her hand and touched Sam Carr's arm with an understanding gentleness, and speaking as though afraid of disturbing him, she said, "'If you would only listen to me before doing anything.' Her simple earnestness made her shy, her humility made her falter and look away, but in a moment she was smiling gravely again, and she said, with a kind of patient dignity, "'What did you intend to do, Mr. Carr?' "'I was going to get a cop. That's what I ought to do.' "'Yes, I suppose so. "'It's not for me to say, because he's my son, "'yet I sometimes think a little good advice "'is the best thing for a boy "'when he's at a certain period in his life,' she said. "'Alfred couldn't understand his mother's quiet composure, "'for if they'd been at home "'and someone had suggested that he was going to be arrested, "'he knew she'd be in a rage and would cry out against him. "'Yet now she was standing there with that gentle, "'pleading smile on her face, saying, "'I wonder if you don't think it would be better "'just to let him come home with me.' He looks a big fellow, doesn't he? It takes some of them a long time to get any sense. And they both stared at Alfred, who shifted away with a bit of light shining for a moment on his thin face and the tiny pimples over his cheekbone. But even while he was turning away, uneasily, Alfred was realising that Mr Carr had become aware that his mother was really a fine woman. He knew that Sam Carr was puzzled by his mother, as if he'd expected her to come in and plead with him tearfully, and instead he was being made to feel a bit ashamed by her vast tolerance. While there was only the sound of the mother's soft, assured voice in the store, Mr Carr began to nod his head encouragingly at her. Without being alarmed, while just being large and still and simple and hopeful, she was becoming dominant there in the dimly lit store. "'Of course I don't want to be harsh,' Mr Carr was saying. "'I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just fire him and let it go at that. How's that?' And he got up and shook hands with Mrs Higgins, bowing low to her in deep respect. There was such warmth and gratitude in the way she said, "'I'll never forget your kindness,' that Mr Carr began to feel warm and genial himself. "'Sorry we had to meet this way,' he said. "'But I'm glad I got in touch with you. Just wanted to do the right thing, that's all,' he said." "'It's better to meet like this than never, isn't it?' she said. Suddenly they clasped hands as if they'd liked each other, as if they'd known each other a really long time. "'Good night, sir,' she said. "'Good night, Mrs Higgins. I'm truly sorry,' he said. The mother and son walked along the street together, and the mother was taking a long, firm stride as she looked ahead with her stern face full of worry. Alfred was afraid to speak to her. He was afraid of the silence that was between them, so he only looked ahead too, for the excitement and relief was still pretty strong in him. But in a little while, going along like that in silence made him terribly aware of the strength and the sternness in her. He began to wonder what she was thinking of as she stared ahead so grimly. She seemed to have forgotten that he walked beside her, so when they were passing under the Sixth Avenue elevated and the so when they were passing under the 6th Avenue, elevated, and the rumble of the train seemed to break the silence, he said in his old, blustering way, "'Thank God it turned out like that. I certainly won't get in a jam like that again. Be quiet. Don't speak to me. You've disgraced me again and again,' she said bitterly. 
Well, that's the last time. That's all I'm saying. Have the decency to be quiet, she snapped. They kept on their way, looking straight ahead. When they were at home, and his mother took off her coat, Alfred saw that she was really only half-dressed, and she made him feel afraid again when she said, without even looking at him, You're a bad lot. God forgive you. It's one thing after another and always has been. Why do you stand there stupidly? Go to bed, why don't you? When he was going, she said, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. Mine now, not a word about tonight to your father. While Alfred was undressing in his bedroom, he heard his mother moving around the kitchen. She filled the kettle and put it on the stove. She moved a chair. And as he listened, there was no shame in him, just wonder, and a kind of admiration of her strength and repose. He could still see Sam Carr nodding his head encouragingly to her. He could hear her talking simply and earnestly. And as he sat on his bed, he felt a pride in her strength. She certainly was smooth, he thought. Gee, I'd like to tell her she sounded swell. And at last he got up and went along to the kitchen. And when he was at the door, he saw his mother pouring herself a cup of tea. He watched, and he didn't move. Her face, as she sat there, was a frightened, broken face, utterly unlike the face of the woman who had been so assured a little while ago in the drugstore. When she reached out and lifted the kettle to pour hot water in her cup, her hand trembled, and the water splashed on the stove. Leaning back in the chair, she sighed and lifted the cup to her lips, and her lips were groping loosely as if they would never reach the cup. She swallowed the hot tea eagerly, and then she straightened up in relief, though her hand holding the cup still trembled. She looked very old. It seemed to Alfred that this was the way it had been every time he had been in trouble before, that this trembling had really been in her as she hurried out half-dressed to the drugstore. He understood why she had sat alone in the kitchen the night his young sister had kept repeatedly, repeating doggedly that she was getting married. Now he felt all that his mother had been thinking of as they walked along the street together a little while ago. He watched his mother and he never spoke, but at that moment his youth seemed to be over. He knew all the years of her life by the way her hand trembled as she raised the cup to her lips. It seemed to him that this was the first time he had ever looked upon his mother. is my coronglae. It's like my obo, but it's a bit bigger, so it's a bit deeper, and it has a, a kind of, it looks like it's laying an egg on the bottom. But it's beautiful to play, even though it can be a little bit of a beast sometimes. The most famous tune on the coronglae is the theme from the Largo from Vorjak's New World Symphony. You'll immediately have um, visions of boys pushing their bikes up cobbled streets delivering hovis bread. with a very famous um, Vorjak piece called Humoresque, which just means a little sort of playful. Ditty's not quite the right word, is it? No, you know what I mean. Playful little song. It's lovely.
again for two um, of his Vaughan Williams' six studies in English folk song. Originally written for cello, these have been adapted for the Cor Anglais. They are beautiful and evoke all sorts of images of, I think, kind of pastoral images of fields and the English countryside. Um, I don't know, sheep in the fields, you name it, meadows of flowers, wind blowing on corn in the summer, they're just beautiful. summary now. Um, right, this, uh, this is a bit of a silly one, um, just a poem by Pam Ayres, um, who I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, and I'm not going to do her distinctive North Berkshire accent, uh, although you can just sort of, you can imagine it. And uh, for those of you who are married or have been or recognise what it's like to live with someone who is quite frustrating and perhaps a little bit pig-headed, uh, this is for you. It's called, They Should Have Asked My Husband. You know, this world is complicated and imperfect and oppressed. And it's not hard to feel timid, apprehensive and depressed. It seems that all around us tides of questions ebb and flow and people want solutions, but they don't know where to go. Opinions abound, but who is wrong and who is right? People need a prophet, a diffuser of the light, someone they can turn to as the crises rage and swirl, someone with the remedy, the wisdom, the pearl. Well, they should have asked my husband. He's a man who likes his say, with his thoughts on immigration, teenage mums, Theresa May, the future of the monarchy, the latest Brexit shocks, the wait for hip replacements, and the rubbish on the box. Yes, they should have asked my husband. He can sort out any mess. He can rejuvenate the railways, cure the NHS. So, any little niggle, anything you want to know, just run it past my husband. Wind him up and let him go. Congestion on the motorways, free holidays for thugs, the damage to the ozone layer, refugees, drugs, these may defeat the brain of any politician bloke, but present it to my husband and he'll solve it at a stroke. He'll clarify the situation, he'll make it crystal clear, you'll feel the glazing of your eyeballs and the bending of your ear. You may lose the will to live, you may feel your shoulders slump when he talks about the president, Mr Donald Trump. 
Upon these areas he brings his intellect to shine, in a great compelling voice that's twice as loud as yours or mine. I often wonder what it must be like to be so strong, infallible, articulate, self-confident, and wrong. When it comes to tolerance, he hasn't got a lot. Joyriders should be guillotined and muggers should be shot. The sound of his own voice becomes like music to his ears, and he hasn't got an inkling that he's boring us to tears. My friends don't call so often. They have busy lives, I know. But it's not every day you want to hear a windbag suck and blow. Google? Safari? On them we never call. Why bother with computers when my husband knows it all? OK, so we're going to Scotland now. Um, this is um, a very short suite called Celtic Suite, and it's an arrangement of some Scottish folk songs by a chap called George McElwam. Um, George played a uh, principal flute in the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra for a while, and he's a prolific composer, and obviously as a flautist he wrote lots of wonderful music for the flute. So this is the first time Julie and I have played this together. Um, we're going to have a little stop to change instruments and a poetry interlude as well, but basically this is the Celtic Suite by George McElwell. Yourself out. Uh, this is, uh, in keeping with the Scottish theme, there, a poem by Rabbi Burns. Um, the probably the most famous thing that he's done as well. Uh, and this was a song initially, um, written in 1794, and it's called "A Red Red Rose." Oh, my love is like a red red rose that's newly sprung in June. Oh, my love is like the melody that's sweetly played in tune. So fair art thou, my bonny lass. So deep in love am I, and I will love thee still, my dear, till all the seas gang dry. Till all the seas gang dry, my dear, and the rocks melt with the sun. I will love thee still, my dear, while the sands of life shall run. And fare thee weel, my only love, and fare thee weel a while, and I will come again, my love, though it were ten thousand miles.
And so from one extreme to the other, this is the alto flute, which is a bit bigger than the conventional flute. So you can have a look. And a bit wider at the bottom, which is why it's got that lovely dark sound. And we're going to jump from that to the piccolo for the last of the Celtic suite, which is called Over the Hills and Far Away. with a bit of Burns thrown in the middle there. <laughs> so we're going to end our world tour with a little um, excursion to Ireland. Um, I love playing Irish music um, and I brought some Irish flutes and whistles along for you. Um, the first piece we're going to play is called O, o Caroline's Welcome and that goes into the Flowers of Red Hill and those will be played on a simple Irish folk flute. sound. Um, so this is like your standard tin whistle and this one is an octave lower, a low D whistle and we're going to play two tunes, um, the Shores of Loch Gowna and Ryan's favourite and there's a chap called Ryan working here so this one's for you Ryan.
And then to finish with, this is the last ones from Julie and I, um, the Penny Whistle. And these two tunes are called Within a Mile and The Marquee of Lawn. Now, if you've been sitting very still listening to us so far, this is a good one to change all that. Get some exercise, tap along, clap, have a bit of a, have a, bit of a dance. I won't attempt to do some Irish dancing to give you some ideas, although my children spend their entire lives Irish dancing. Um, so enjoy this. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you all enjoyed it wherever you were watching that and uh, I hope that uh, you are you know now thoroughly entertained and exhausted after dancing your your, your jigs in wherever you may be sitting there your living room or whether you're with a bunch of people um, I hope you enjoyed it and um, hopefully we'll do plenty more of these um, but yeah it's lovely to be here in the Wiltshire Music Centre it's been brilliant to hear Julie and Nicola and um, yeah I mean I'm giving I hope you're giving them all a massive virtual standing ovation right now um, and yeah this has been brought to you by Celebrating Age Wiltshire uh, I'm just going to do one um, Irish blessing uh, to uh, end the concert and thank you so much again and to Rebecca Seymour who organises all of this and to everyone here at Wiltshire Music Centre and Ben behind the camera today uh, and this is um, an Irish blessing May the road rise up to meet you May the wind be always at your back May the sun shine warm upon your face The rains fall soft upon your fields And until we meet again May God hold you in the palm of his hand Thank you very much. Bye-bye.